going to be doing some transformations here. First, we'll talk about how Froggy moves around. Here's our able assistant Froggy. Hi there. We'll put a line down the middle. Froggy here. Okay, there's Froggy. And now, watch closely. Froggy here. Okay, one more time. Here's Froggy original. Here's Froggy copy. Question is, is Froggy original congruent to Froggy copy in this transformation? And the answer is yes, it is. Froggy is still the same size and shape, despite the fact that here Froggy copy is a mirror image of Froggy original. We still consider that to be congruent. So that means that this particular transformation from Froggy to Froggy copy is an isometry with regard to rotation. Rotation is referred to usually relative to a clock. So, so for those of you who were born in this millennium, you'll have to re-familiarize yourself with an analog clock. It turns this direction and the direction that the clock goes we call clockwise. That's why we call it that because that's the way the clock goes. And that's how we refer to rotations as clockwise or against the clock or counterclockwise. In geometry, when we, ju when we don't say which direction to go, the default direction is to go counterclockwise. So if I say, froggy, go 90 degrees. Rotate 90 degrees, frog. I'll go like this. He's rotated 90 degrees counterclockwise. This is 90, this is 180 degrees. I don't have to say it, but it's also counterclockwise. Here is 270. Notice that 270 looks the same as a clockwise rotation of 90. The only way you know the difference is how you got there. So if I want him to go clockwise, I say, must say frog clockwise 90 degrees, and he'll go like this. Okay. So that's rotations for us. We're going to do. Some exercises here. You'll need some little papers or some graph paper. The first one we're going to do is reflection across a line. So choose two points on the left of the line. It doesn't matter which two. And then another point on the right of the line. Make a triangle. Label it. We'll give it a name. I think I'll name, name this one frog without an O. Oh, never mind. I'll name it cat. C-A-T. So there is triangle cat. I'm going to reflect each of the vertices in the line. Think about when you're looking in a mirror, you want to look at yourself, you got to look right in the mirror. So the line of sight goes directly into the mirror and, and bounces back at you so you can see it. The line of sight is perpendicular to the mirror. So we'll draw some lines here that are perpendicular. I'll start with that one. Perpendicular, the line of sight from T to the mirror is perpendicular to the mirror. Reflections are always equidistant, so we'll have one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. So we'll draw, draw the point T prime equidistant from the mirror. So again, equidistant. These two portions of the line of, line of sight are equidistant, and the line of sight from T prime to T is bisected. You should be doing this, please, and go ahead and do it for your other two points. So I'll do it for point C and for point A. And I'll draw a cat prime.
So now I've got triangle cat and triangle cat prime. It's kind of a double reflection in a mirror, but reflecting, reflecting from both sides. If you think about it, that kind of looks like maybe you're spinning it around from blue to red around the, re the uh, mirror. That's actually a concept that you'll get into in calculus. You're learning this now so that when you get there, you can do it. So what do we see again about the characteristics of cat and cat prime? Reflection in a line. In or across, it doesn't matter. We, should, we say it both ways. Okay, so for reflections in a line, The lines of sight, for example, A and A prime, are bisected by the mirror line, which is the line of reflection. The mirror line is perpendicular to the lines of sight, each one of them, and the lines of sight are parallel. Okay, our next new little piece of paper. We're going to reflect in the y-axis. Draw yourself the axes, pick any three points in the second quadrant, draw them out and label them. Just as we've just did, just done, excuse me, with a respect to a line, go ahead and reflect them. This is pay, P-E-I, for a girl in the class pay. So we'll do reflect pay. To form pay prime. Go ahead and put her coordinates, the new coordinates for her point as well. As you're doing these, try to see if you notice some similarities among the coordinates. What can you see about the coordinates? Hopefully you can see that all of the uh, y's are still the same, but the x's are the negative. Like here it's negative 3, positive 3, negative 5, 5, negative 1, 1. So we can see we can write in mapping terminology, we can say that x, y, every point x, y maps to the point negative x, y. That would be the mapping way to describe this transformation. Let's also look at the possibility of using a matrix to describe it. So please write down for each one, for pay and pay prime, or whatever you call yours, reflection in the y-axis, write down the coordinates. Now let's recall that when we put um, coordinates into a matrix, it is our convention to make a two-row matrix. The top row is the x value, the bottom row is the y value. So here pay, p of pay is negative 5, 7. So the coordinates are negative 5, 7. x is negative 5, 7 is y. Same for e, negative 1, 9, negative 1, 9. i, negative 3, 1, negative 3, 1. Go ahead and make a matrix for your triangle, pay and pay prime. Once you've done that, we want to figure out a way to multiply by a transformation matrix to go from pay to pay prime. Transformation matrix is always going to be two by two. Can we multiply? Well, let's see. Two columns, two rows. The middle numbers are the same. So yes, we can. And then the other numbers columns of the first, uh, excuse me, rows of the first and columns of the second. Yes, we can multiply these. So go ahead and figure it out.
And what it's going to be then is negative 1, 0. Let's see how that works. Negative 1, remember you do the first row element times first column element, and then first row second, the corresponding elements. Multiply them and then add them. So negative 5 times negative 1 is positive 5 times z plus 0 times 7, 0. 5 plus 0 is 5. So it worked. Does it work for the others? Let's see. Negative 1 times negative 1 is 1 plus 9 times 0. Yes, that's 1. Negative 3 times negative 1. Negative 1 times negative 3 is 3 plus 1 times 0 is 3. Yes, it works. So figure out the second one the one for the uh, second row, pause it if you hadn't figured it out, that'll be 0, 1 to get it. So that gets us our transformation matrix to, uh, for a reflection in the y-axis or across the y-axis. The language is the same. It means the same. Okay, so now for your next one you're going to need a little bit of portrait orientation. Choose um, three points in quadrants one and two. We're going to reflect them across the x-axis. We'll do that the same as we've done the others. This one is Jill with one L. So here will be Jill Prime. Go ahead and put her coordinates in. And draw your transformed triangle. Again, we're doing it relative to the x-axis. It's flipping across the x-axis. Having done that, look at the look at the commonalities between the um, um, coordinates. Notice what happened, and see what the mapping is. The mapping for this is going to be. A reflection in the x-axis maps each point x, y to x, negative y. Next, go ahead and look. Write out the coordinates of Jill and Jill Prime and figure out what the transformation matrix would need to be. To multiply the first row times the first column, corresponding elements of the first row times corresponding elements of the second, and add them. What would it need to be? So we see that it stays the same for this, so it'll be 1, 0, the other changes 0, negative 1. Make sure you see how that works. The next exercise will be reflection in the line y equals x. You're all proud graduates of Algebra 1. You know that the line y equals x is the line whose slope is 1 and whose y-intercept is 0. So go ahead and draw that in. When you draw it in, make sure you split all the little diamonds half and two so that you can do a decent job of drawing y equals x. Now, um, doing the reflection here is going to be a little bit more of a challenge. <coughs> <coughs> Excuse me. Because we don't have a straight grid to work on. You're going to need to line up your ruler so that it's going to go right through 
make the hypotenuse of all the little squares, split the diamond in two. So here I'm doing I. to get I, oh, this one's Rhea. Okay, Rhea. Notice that Rhea is one diamond away. The I of Rhea is one diamond away, so it'll be one diamond away. Do the same for the others. Make sure you split your diamonds so you can count them. A is two diamonds away. Look on the on the R. It's one, two, three, and a half diamonds. So you do a half, one, two, three. Put your coordinates. Oh, I'm doing the wrong one. Sorry. Draw Rhea in, and notice that she's reflected across the line y equals x. Look at what happens to the coordinates and tell me what the mapping is. I think you're going to notice pretty quickly that the change is that the x and y switch. So if you would, oh, that was supposed to be airy. Okay, Rhea or airy. We've got both of them in the class. Here we go. I wrote it out as airy, but Rhea works just fine. What would the trans transformation matrix be for either Rhea or airy? It's going to have to switch them. So what will work is this. So here we'll have 0 times 1 is 0, plus 5 is 5. 3 times 0 is 0, plus 10 is 10. Notice that it works. Okay? For Rhea and Ari. Okay, the next one is going to be reflection across the line y equals negative x. So we've got Zoe. Go ahead and construct or draw um, your coordinate axes so that you can see the second quad quadrant rail. Put in the line y equals negative x. Again, a slope of negative 1, intercept of 0. Going to need to reflect in the same fashion. Draw straight through the diamonds to have your line of sight perpendicular to the line of reflection. And count your diamonds. Here on the E on Zoe, it didn't split the middle, it was only half. Three whole diamonds for O prime. And for Z prime, two whole diamonds. We'll draw in Zoe. And look at what happened to the coordinates. Figure out the mapping. Oh, look. Negative 3, 2 goes to negative 2, 3. The mapping is every point x, y maps to the point negative y, x. Think about what it, write out your 
matrices, your Zoe matrices, Zoe and Zoe prime, and figure out what it would take to do this. Okay, what is it? Well, they're switched and both of them are negative. So that's going to be 0, negative 1, negative 1, 0 for Zoe prime. Our next one will be a rotation. And it will be a rotation. We're going to use the origin. It will be a rotation about the origin. So in the first quadrant, go ahead and draw a triangle. Label it. This is going to be Sam for Samantha. Once you've done it, pick any one point, notice the coordinates of it, and connect that point to the origin. When we talk about rotations, they're always going to be about a specific point. We're going to, or, we're going to rotate Sam about the origin and see what happens to the points. So first off, Draw a Sam, draw a reference line to the origin. That's how we'll know how much it's, it's uh, rotating. Then take a piece of patty paper or clear plastic, copy Sam and the reference line. Then we're going to rotate it counterclockwise, which is the default. I'll rotate it 90 degrees to make a right angle. And notice that when I have done that and made a right angle, the S in SAM is now at negative 5, 1. So it goes from 1, 5 to negative 5, 1 with a 90 degree rotation. I'll ro rotate it to 180 degrees. Now the S moves to negative 1, negative 5. The same numbers, but negative. I rotate it another uh, 90 degrees to 270. And now Sam, the S in Sam, is at 5, negative 1. So again, in all four quadrants, it's still the same numbers, 1 and 5. In the opposite when they're negative, and in the two adjacent ones to where we start, they're switched, and one of them's negative. A summary of that is here, and our little sheet, which you should get for your cipher also has the summary of the mapping that we just did about the x-axis, the y-axis, y equals x, and y equals negative x. So make sure you make a note of this. A problem. Ah, uh, there we go. You're going to a parking lot. You're going to buy books. Your friend is going to buy CDs. Where should you park to minimize the distances you will both walk? Highly important here. I'll draw it out. It's drawn out here as a possibility, and I'll show you how it works. So what we'll be dealing with here is a number of problems. It's good in the parking lot, but this is also how um, you, how you decide how the power company decides where the best place to put um, a pole is. I'll show you what we mean here. We want to go from A to B, but we have to tag the axis along the way and make it the shortest distance possible to travel. Now, obviously, the shortest distance between A and B is a straight line but with the additional proviso that we must pass by, touch the x-axis, that makes it a little more complicated. Here's how we can work on it. Okay, well, I'm going to reflect point B in the x-axis. So my line of reflection will come down right here, my line of sight to my line of reflection to my mirror line. It's up six, so it'll be down six. One, two, three, four, five, six. So this will be B, which is 12, negative six. 
Okay, I hope we can agree that the shortest distance between A and B prime is a straight line. All right. What if I go from the intersection with the axis, which is where we have to tag it, and turn around and go back up to B? Notice that, uh, and I'll call this C. Notice that BC is congruent to B prime C. It's the same distance. Therefore, this is the point to tag the x-axis, which makes the shortest distance between A and B with the proviso that you must come to the axis. So this would be the best place to park in the parking lot and an, a, a real an application that happens all the time, we can, as you drive down the street, you see that uh, power poles are not always equidistant from the two places that they serve. They use something like this to figure out how to do that. Why? Because they want to use the shortest amount of wire to do the job. Because wire costs money, and they're in the, in the business to make money, and they want to use as little bit of wire and still do the job well. So if you have a residence here at A, a residence here at B, and you need a pole to serve them both, this would be the place to put the pole that uses the least amount of wire and therefore is more cost effective, at least with regard to that criteria. So we'll have a few things to do. And you should get a copy of the matrix of the this, which will be available for you in the classroom. Make sure you get one, but here it is right here that shows you the uh, rotation matrices in a summary. These are the ones that we just talked about with Sam going around the origin. And here endeth the lesson.